And so tonight, I want to dwell on timing and seasons, as written in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 1 and following. So Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 1. We're linking it up with what we studied last week in the context of time and seasons. We have often said that God is not, does not operate by calendar. He does not operate by calendar. We made calendar. Humans made calendar. But God made time and seasons. And how do we know this? Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, before we come over to Ecclesiastes 3. How do we know that humans made calendar, but God made time and seasons? So he does not operate by January, February, and March, and all of those things. Those are man-made. But he operates by time and season. So Genesis 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 helps us to understand this. This is the story of the creation. And it says, and God said, and God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven. Let there be light. We're not talking about sun. Sun is different. This is not sun. It said, let there be light. Let there be light. And in the firmament of the heaven, to divide, to divide the day from the night, to divide the day from the night, and let them, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Just look at that scripture. Do we see calendar there? Do we see January? Do we see April, May, June, July, and the rest of them? No. He created lights, plural. Let there be lights, plural, in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day and the night. Let them be for season and for days and for years. So we return to Ecclesiastes, the preacher, Chapter 3, from verse 1. It said, to everything, every single thing, man, woman, animals, plants, it don't matter. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. It doesn't matter if it is humans. It doesn't matter if it is animals. It doesn't matter if it is plants. The Bible says, to every single thing, there is a season. To every single thing, there is a season. And a time for every purpose underneath the heaven. So if, if you are in this world, the Bible is saying that to you and to me, there is a season. There is a season. Now, God moves, what I said, God moves with time and seasons, not calendars. So if we're counting our days by calendar, we might just miss the purpose of God. But when we begin to look at our life in the context of seasons and timing, then we flow in the Holy Ghost. Now, take the ego, for instance. The ego does not fly like the birds, or the birds that you see flapping its wing. No, you don't see the ego do that. The ego read the time of the wind, and then floats into it and spread out its wings and then it flows, it soars 
and it begins to cruise as the wind go, the eagle go, balancing itself. It's effortless because it's not using strength and power to fly. The eagle glides in the wind. Why? Because it is sensitive enough to understand the exact timing to get into the wind. So sensitivity in the spirit helps me to understand seasons and times. And the seasons and times are the modus operandi of God. God moves by it. And so the Bible says to every single thing in this world, there is a season to your life to my life, to everything that God has given to you, there is a season. And understanding that season and time helps you to work with God. If we lack understanding of the season, then we're not able to work with God. And therefore, we may be missing out on God's will for our lives. So there is a need for us to understand the move of God. So like an ego, we soar in it. Now what does the Bible say in 1 Chronicle chapter 12, verse 32? It talks about the children of Issachar. For they have understanding of the times. So which means that somebody can have understanding of the times and seasons. The children of Issachar in the scripture had a strategic advantage over the other tribes for they understood the times and what Israel ought to do. So there are certain things that need to be done at certain times. If I miss the time, then I miss that opportunity. Sowing is done at certain time, except we intervene in natural process of sowing and reaping. Certain time, you put your seed in the ground. Like here in the northeast, we don't plant grass during winter time. You, you can put your seed down in the fall time, but you don't plant grass in the wind, in the dead of the winter because there's snow all over the place. And you don't plant grass in the summertime in the dead of the heat because the heat is going to scotch it. So there's a window of time every year that we ought to put down our seeds for it to grow and be ready for the elements of the weather. So if I miss that window, I gotta wait till next year. If I miss the window, I gotta wait till next year. So the children of Israel, they have a strategic advantage over the other tribes, for they knew the times and knew exactly what should be done at those times. So the question is, are we able to flow in God's timing? Specific time that God has ordained. And in, in the Greek language, we have two words because the, the New Testament was written in Greek. We have two words that is translated time in the Greek New Testament. The first translation of time is chronos. Chronos. Chronos is the same Greek word where we got the English word chronology. Chronology, which is a sequence of things in order. An orderly sequence of things. Chronology. If you're reading new 
the numerical values in this chronological, chronological order, you go from one, you go from two, you go to three, you go to four. That is chronology. If you're reading alphabet, you go from A, B, C, and D. It is a chronological order. You can't jump from A to D. You disorganize the order. So chronos is the sequence of time, which is one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. You can't jump from one o'clock to six o'clock, except you're traveling from one zone to the other. Even then, you're still going to be changing time as you travel through different time zones. So that is chronology. And it it's in order. It's a sequence and it's in order. God is not the author of confusion. God works orderly. So that's one word that is used in the Greek to identify time. And another word, the second one is kairos. Kairos. Kairos is a defined moment or opportunity that brings you to the next level. So within the chronology of time, there's a defined day or year or moment that God has set in his calendar to lift you up or to bring you to your next level. It's up to you and me to understand that time. Like the eagle, understand when to get on into the wind. If it does at the wrong time, it's not going to work. If you go too early, it won't work. If you go too fast, it won't work. He needs to understand the movement of the wind and then get right in without getting into turbulence. So it's up to me and up to you to be sensitive in the spirit to understand because the word of God said to everything there's a season. To everything there is a season. And in verse 11 of the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says he made everything beautiful in his time. That's what they said. He made he had made everything beautiful in his time. Not your time, not my time, not East Coast time, not West Coast time, not African time, not European time, but in God's own time, he makes everything beautiful. It is in his time. But I need to understand and be sensitive in the spirit to know his time. Because if I don't, I will miss my opportunity. Kairos is the opportune time. In order not to miss the moment, we must maximize the tools that's given to us in Kronos time. Every, every single day that precedes the other, it's an opportunity for me to be prepared for what is coming. It's for me to be prepared for what is coming. A lot of Christians focus on things. Rather than focus on things, acquiring things, what I can get from this, we should pay attention to timing. There's a saying that timing is everything. And there's, there's a great amount of truth to that. Timing can make a difference. If you get to the airport late, you miss your flight. Timing is everything. If you get there early, you get on the flight. When you miss your flight, you may not fly that day. It delays you. So in order to avoid delay, I need to know when the plane is going to leave. 
And I need to be there before the plane leaves. Not only being there, but I need to be a lot to hear the announcement that boarding has started. Not only hearing that boarding has started, but physically take the step to be in line. Not only just be in line, but have the necessary document to board the flight. All of those things are my responsibility and your responsibility to understand the time. And, and there's also a difference between activity and opportunity. The devil does not want you and me to take advantage of the opportunity that God presents to us. And sometimes he gives us a lot of activity to occupy us so we're not sensitive to what God is about to do next. That's why Paul said, I leave the things behind, I press for the things that I have. Success is good, but dwelling in the, in the current success without paying attention to what is next, you might just miss the next opportunity that God has for you and for me. There is a set time that God wants to do certain things. And as I was thinking about this teaching today, I started to think about how we got to this church where we are today. And when we were in Providence and we were on Visit Street. And over there, for those who were there with us will remember that we're praying that God will give us that building where we were then, we were renting. We're praying. We're, sometimes I walk around the building and we pray. We have ministers of God who visited from other parts of the world to preach in our church. They prayed over the the, the building that we, we may have that building. And then 2015 it was, and the Lord said, we're going to move. And I started to feel that in my spirit. Move to where? We've been praying to have this building. Why are we going to move? And that was how we started to look for a place to buy. And that's how we come here. Story Story, long story short, we found ourselves in Johnson. It was a time that God has kept in his calendar for us to be here at that time. And all of the event that followed, which you know and I know all too well, would not have happened had we stayed back in Visit Street. And we had a choice. To stay back in Visit Street and say, no, we're not moving. We want to stay back here. We had a choice. God wasn't forcing us to move. No. We could have stayed in Visit Street and just remained there. But I tell you, had we remained at Visit Street, what God has done for the last few years through this church and in our life and in my life would not have happened. We would have missed an opportunity that God has reserved for us. Because we didn't know any better. So timing is absolutely critical and absolutely important. And I can give more example and more example where things happen and you're just like, I'm so glad that I'm in the right place at the right time. And it was even yesterday. I was at an event yesterday. I was invited to come over there. And I went. I didn't have to go. And I went over there. And I was in the crowd and greeting everybody and all of that and all of that. And somebody walked up to me and said, Pastor, I was driving by the church the other day and I saw that some, some pieces of shingle has fallen off the roof. He said, your roof is pretty new. I don't know why you're losing shingle. I said, I don't know either. He said, well, I'm a roofer. I'm going to come over there. I'm going to fix it for you at no cost. I would never have met that man had I not attended that event last night. If I, if I said, well, I'm too tired. I can't go. Oh, it's, it's beautiful out. Let me stay home. If I was not physically there, I would miss that opportunity to meet that individual. And so sometimes God reserves people 
in our lives to be a blessing to us and set them up a certain time. And if you're not sensitive enough to follow the Lord, the Bible says the steps of the righteous, they are ordered by God. If you're not sensitive enough to follow God, you might miss that encounter. And that encounter might be an encounter that changed your life forever. The encounter of moving this church from Providence to Johnston has changed my life a great deal. I would have missed that opportunity if I was not sensitive to God. If it makes sense, sometimes what God wants to do does not make sense. But the sons of Issachar, they understood the time, they understood exactly what needs to be done. And so, God creates opportunity, the devil creates activity. God creates opportunity, the devil creates activity. Activity is meant to keep you busy, busy work. And in that busy work, you miss out on the purpose of God for your life because you are encumbered by busy work. Let us be sensitive to each opportunity that God wants to put in our lives because he operates by time and seasons. There's a season that's coming. And I, if I'm not sensitive to understand that season, I'll miss out in what is happening in that season. You cannot have a sowing mentality during harvest time. Same way, we cannot have a harvest mentality during sowing time. It doesn't work. You cannot be harvesting when it's sowing time. And you can be sowing when it's harvest time. You have to have the right mentality for the right season. And that's how you get breakthroughs. That's how you get great things happening in your life. You find yourself in the right place, meeting the right people, having the right connection. The right connection brings you to the next level, to the next level, to the next level of your life. And so there are many of us who are missing out in the will and the plan of God for our lives because we are missing an understanding of what God wants to do. And the sad thing, the sad thing is that because of pride, some people have walked away from what God wants to do in their life because of pride. And you see a lot of that in society today. Say, well, you know, I, I don't want to work for you. I don't, God, God may want you to be in that place for that moment and, and you're, you're missing what God wants to do in your life by putting you there. Look at Haggai, for instance. Haggai was the maid or the handmaid of Sarah. You remember? The handmaid of Sarah was Haggai. And Haggai had Ishmael. And Haggai started to be a little prideful because Sarah had not had Isaac. And Sarah was mad. And Sarah came, told Abraham that this lady needs to leave. I just don't like her. But caught the long, long story short, you can read the Bible. Haggai left. And now with Ishmael in the wilderness. Guess what happened? They were there in the wilderness and famishing. And Haggai said, I don't want to see my child die. They have nothing. And she put the child over there and she went over there and the Lord ministered to her and told her, return to Sarah. Go back there. Go back to the same place where she thought that she was being mistreated. You know why? Because her destiny was tied to that place. Some of us quit jobs if, without consulting God. Just because the job is a little difficult doesn't mean you leave. Some of us break relationship because it's a little turbulent. God is working something with it. 
without consulting God, they just don't walk away. There are folks who leave church because their friend left church. Oh, my friend left, I leave too. You, you and your friend don't have the same destiny. You're losing out on what God wants to do in your life. You don't know what, what God has next for you. And you know, some people say, well, when opportunity goes, it comes back. There are some opportunities that don't return. Some opportunity will not come back. Yesterday is not coming back. No matter how you, how you pray. Yesterday, yesterday is gone. It's not coming back. It's gone into history. An hour ago, it's gone into eternity. It's not coming back. You miss that opportunity, it's gone. There are certain things you cannot do at certain times. There are certain things you need to do at certain times. So you just don't make decisions, especially life-changing decisions, because of somebody. No, oh, I do it because my friend does it. I do it because I was told to do it. You cannot live your life like that. You've got to be sensitive enough to the Lord and ask him. And God, like, like Sarah and Hagar, God can tell you, let your friend go. You stay here because in this place, I will bless you. Is that not what he said to Isaac? There was famine in the land and Isaac was a little scared. And then he said, I'm going to Egypt. And the Lord said, no, you're not. You're not going to Egypt. I want to stay here in the land of famine. Stay there. I'll bless you in it. And, and, and he told him, put seed on the ground and see what's going to happen. The same place that he was about to take off from and go to another country, God interrupted it. Thank God that Isaac listened to God. Some of us don't listen. Even when God said, don't go, you say, pack up, you go. There are some people who met their untimely death because they disobeyed God. They didn't wait on the Lord. God tried to interrupt them to stop them. They refused. And they kept going. And God let them go. And they're going to get, get to heaven. You can't blame God for that. No, you can't blame God. You blame your very self for not listening to God. Isaac was going to move to Egypt from the land of the Philistines. And the Lord said, don't go anywhere. Stay here. I know there's famine. I created heavens and, and the earth. I created the rain. I created everything. Stay here. Even the sea. And he told him, sow in the land. And Isaac began to sow when there was famine. Then there was drought, there was no rain. God said, put your seed down. Don't go to Egypt. I know Egypt is rosy. Things are good. The economy is good in Egypt. But I want you to stay here. You just don't move because, because somebody moved. Oh yeah, because my friend moved to, to California. I'm moving to California. You cannot do that as a Christian. Because sometimes your destiny is tied to seven people. Sometimes your destiny is tied to a certain location. And you need to be in that location. And so Isaac stayed there. Isaac sowed in the land. Isaac received a hundredfold of harvest in the same year. So God proved to him, I am your unlimited supply. I'm your Jehovah Jireh. I'm your El Shaddai. It's not the economy but God. And so before you take a step, do anything, you need to consult the Holy Spirit. If he say go, you go. That's what David did. David said, shall I, shall I, shall I pursue? Shall I pursue? And the Lord said, yes, pursue. Not only did you pursue, you overtake them. Not only you overtake them, you recover all. In other words, you're going to defeat them. But he asked God first, shall I? When was the last time you asked God? Shall I pursue? We just make decisions, make plans, and we don't even talk to God about it. And so, there are spirits, listen to this, there are spirits that are assigned to deplete your time and abolish your season. The Bible talks about the canker worms and the palmer worms. What do they eat? They eat the years. 
the years that the palmer worms have eaten. Those are not regular worms. Those are not regular, regular creature. Regular creature don't eat years. They eat, they eat seeds. They eat fruit. They eat plants. But it talks about they eat the canker worms and the northern animals that, that eat up the years. It said, I will restore the years. Have you, haven't you read the Bible? That God always talk about restoring years, restoring time. Because if you lose everything in life, as long as you have time, you can still recover. One of the things that we regret the most in life is time. A lot of people regret. They, they, they come to an old age and they regret. They regret that they didn't have time to do A, B, C, D. They regret. Oh, if I had time, I would do this. If I had time, I would do that. If I had time when I was younger, I would do this. So what brings the most regret in people's life is time. They don't have the time anymore. And one of the things that we hear a lot is that, oh, I'm so busy, I don't have the time to do this. I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the time to do this. Because time is so precious. When it goes away, it goes away. There's only 24 hours in a day. Every one of us has 24 hours in a day. Nobody has 25, but the other person has 26. Every single person has 24 hours in a day to use. It's up to you how you use your 24 hours every day. It's up to you. You can decide to waste your 24 hours. You can decide to sleep through your 24 hours. It's up to you. But in the end, when time is no longer, you will look back, you regret, and say, well, I wish I had the time. And there are many today, including Christians, who regret it that they have no time. So there are spirits that is assigned to deplete your time and abolish your season. What are you supposed to do about it? Be sensitive. Be sensitive to know that the enemy is trying to obstruct your season. Be sensitive to know that the enemy is trying to obstruct your season. That's exactly what it's after. Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden was to obstruct that season. That's it. What the, what the devil does is, is really to obstruct us from getting into our season. Because if we're able to get into every season that God has for us, then there's no regret in life. Breakthroughs upon breakthroughs and another level upon another level. We're mounting up like eagles and we're, we're just, things are just working right. When seasons intersect and things, time and seasons are aligned every single day, you don't need to walk so hard. The favor of God will make it happen for you. The devil knows that and therefore he wants to obstruct our seasons. That's why when, when he knows that you are at the edge of your breakthrough, he can just create some, some turbulence. And then in anger, you walk away from that job. You're just about to learn something that will change your life or meet somebody that will change your life. And the devil creates turbulence, set up people against you, and obstruct everything. You say, okay, now, how does the devil know that my season is coming? He doesn't know the exact season, but he has an idea. Just as you go out in the daytime and you see the cloud in the heaven, what do you think? What comes to your mind? Oh, there might be rain. It might not be rain. It might just be a cloudy day. But by the fact that you see cloud in the sky, your mind tells you, it's about to rain. And you might be right. You get your umbrella, you're prepared. So the, the devil has been here for a long time. So he knows when there's a shifting in the atmosphere. Even birds know. Birds, animals, they know when it's about to rain. That's they run to hide. 
They don't wait until the drop of rain start to come down. You see them all taking cover before the drops of rain come down. So that the enemies can sense in the atmosphere that something is not quite right. There's alignment in the atmosphere. And so they start to investigate what is this all about? You remember the Magi? Oh, uh, they saw in the sky that there was a strange star. And they said, this is different. And they started to investigate. And through their own astrological knowledge, they said, no, this is, this is different. A king is born. And they followed the star until they got to Bethlehem. Those were regular human beings, but they had, they, they learned astrology to be understood how to read the heavens. So that's how the devil knows. And so he interrupt. He interrupt and deplete our time and abolish our season. And as long as he can do that, he's happy. And then you go back to your prayer room and pray for breakthrough again. Pray for breakthrough again. Not a breakthrough, not a breakthrough. And the breakthrough is about to come. And the devil said, move. Move to California. You get your things and you move to California. And while saying that, I remember this brother. He was right here with us. And he came to me one day and said, I'm moving. I said, where you going? He said, I'm going to Ohio. I said, don't go to Ohio. Stay right here. Stay right here. Don't go to Ohio. And, and he, was, he was on his way when he called me because he didn't want to tell me that he was leaving. He was, he was already on his way. He packed up his leaves and broke his leaves, took his things out of the home, packed up his car, and he was driving to Ohio. On his way to Ohio, he called me and said, Pastor, I'm on my way to Ohio, just want you to know. And he went. Guess what? It wasn't too long. He got sick over there. He died. I believe if he was still here when I told him, don't go, I believe he would have been alive today. Just don't pack up and leave. God wants to give you a breakthrough. The devil tells you, move to California. And then you pack yourself up, you go to California. You just miss your moment. And when that moment is gone, it's gone. But there's something about God. If we, if we speak close to God, God has a way of turning things around when you have the opportunity. God can do certain things to redeem that our time when the devil has depleted them. And that's the mercy of God. But we can, we can avoid getting to this spot of now having to depend on God's mercy if we just do the right thing in the first place. And that's why God, he is not bound by time. He operates outside of time. And therefore he is in control of time. He can speed you up. He can give you speed. Holy Ghost speed. He can. Yes, the Lord can give you speed. And just like in a natural world, if, if you're going to New York, let's say two of us were going to New York, and you decide to drive and I decide to fly, who gets to New York first? The guy who flew. You'll be driving three hours. I'll be there in 40, 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the speed of the plane. By the fact that I flew, I gained speed. It's the same destination. We're human beings, but the difference is the vehicle by which we got there. You were driving a regular vehicle, and I flew. God can put you on an airplane like Philip and transport you through time. And you break, you break the time barrier and you fly to the next level of your life, you gain double promotion, triple promotion, and you catch up. God can make somebody catch up. God can rearrange our seasons, and God can redeem the time for us. And now back to what I was saying. How do I know? How do I know? Seasons and time, revelation and visions, instruction from God. Revelation and visions, and instruction from God. That's how you know. You get a revelation, God speaks to you, He reveals in instructions, He speaks to you directly and says, Do this. In vision, He allows you, opens your eye to see. 
Those are the ways that God can show you that you are about to enter into a new season and you're ready for it. You're ready for it. Praise the Lord. And the last thing I'm going to say is that Christians ought to be always ready for the next. So that when you get there, you're ready. You're ready. The most painful thing in life is that you get to your next season, you are not ready. You are not ready. Because you have not invested time into your chronos, period. So that when you get to your kairos, you're ready. So readiness is absolutely key in all of this.